Hello everyone, welcome to our Tuesday Q&A. I am Eric Griffin, president of ITM Trading. With me I have our chief market analyst, Lynette Zhang. And for those of you who don't know, we take questions emailed to us at questions at itmtrading.com. And I aggregate them here on a one sheet, ask them to her live so you get a real, true, organic response. She's not seen any of these questions today. Nope. All right, Mike R asks, okay. do annuities keep, place, keep pace with inflation so I can at least hold on to my purchasing power during the term I hold it? Well, you know, there's fixed annuities, which are a fixed rate of return, so that would be a definite no. And then there's variable annuities, and that would be a maybe. But, um, you know, really, it's, it's many layers of fees. So overall, what you own is a contract that says that the company will pay you as long as they can afford to. And if it's a variable annuity, you're the one that's taking really all the risk, but your reward is typically capped at a certain level of return. So uh, not that I think we're going to go there now, but um, yeah, annuities are insurance products. And, and initially, the goal was to ensure a steady stream of income for the rest of your life. But over time, like all the other products, fiat products, they've kind of morphed into different things. So a lot of people actually hold them inside of retirement plans, in which case it's redundant because the point of an annuity is to grow that wealth in a tax advantaged way. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, depending upon when and how you take your distribution, part of it is considered a return of principal and part of it is considered gains and that's the taxable part. But because it's supposed, you get it over a long period of time, that's the tax advantage. And that's the same thing with an IRA is, the, is that you're accumulating that wealth in a tax advantaged way. And then you, in theory anyway, when you're older and you start to take that distribution, you're in a lower tax bracket, which is probably not going to happen anymore. <clears throat> so, you know, maybe, but um, probably not. And especially when we go into hyperinflation, definitely not. Well, and yeah, if we go into hyperinflation, are they going to even be able to pay? Exactly. So Larry, exactly. Larry G asks, what happens with the cash you are holding on to, if they force us to go cashless, will we be given a chance to redeposit? Yes. And so, you know, if you've taken it out of your normal bank account, which is not illegal at this time, then you have that paper trail that says where you got that cash from. Now, what they may do, what they typically do, is um, give you a, a drop dead date in which to redeposit that cash and be able to convert it or have it usable again. And they could put limitations on how much you can deposit at any one time. Because the boon for the governments when they demonetize is because what cash really is, it's a, a debt instrument that doesn't pay interest, right? So, uh, you know, whatever cash does not get redeposited, okay, well, that, that's just an advantage to the governments because that's debt they never have to pay back. So it'll be like that. You're going to have some time, but what that cash really is, is your first line of defense because that's what people recognize as money, even though it's just fiat money. First line of defense <clears throat> when, the, when the poop hits the fan. Right. Yeah. When, as we go into the hyperinflation, you know, before people realize how rapidly the currency is losing value, that's what they're still going to accept. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by it's your first line of defense. And in the strategy, you account for that, right? Because it's just a tool of barter. That's really all money is today is simply a tool of barter. Fiat money does not hold its purchasing power over time. So if you get it today and you spend it today, you haven't lost any purchasing power. But if you try and hold on to it and save it, then of course it loses value over time. So it's just a tool of barter. It's your first line of defense when we get into a position where it's really scary out there. But shortly after that, shopkeepers, stores know they can't replace the goods for what 
you're paying them and they're going to want something else that holds value. All right. So Evan W. asks, you talk about the melt up and meltdown phases. Mm -hmm. You say markets are beginning to break down, but then mm -hmm. you say we are in a melt up phase. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the difference and where we are currently? Wow. That is a great question. And I think that's one that actually everybody's asking, even if you listen to Main Street TV, because in many, many ways with the central bank pivot, where they just changed their mind. Okay, they're raising, they're, they're doing quantitative tightening and now, and they couldn't do it. Of course they couldn't do it, shocker. And now they've got to go back to the easing phase. And that's why it's kind of, the markets are schizophrenic right now. Actually, they are so severely overvalued and all of the free money air that they've been, that the central banks have been pumping into the markets, Look at as soon as they withhold any of it or buybacks are frozen or whatever the the financial engineering supports to the market, whenever those are even removed a little bit, the markets implode under their own weight. Mm -hmm. But on the other side of that, they could turn around. And, and since they've made that pivot, what's the next thing? Dropping rates and going back into QE. And since you have, the reason why I'm saying the melt-up phase is because you this year have all of these unicorns that are not making money, but yet valued in the many billions of dollars simply because that's how much the funding was coming to market, which absolutely indicates a market top. But are they going to want to finish making that transfer? So are Probably we in melt so. up now or? Well, if they turn around and lower the rates, which will be the next step, and reinstate the QE, the money press, which we'll be able to see. Well, we, we still see it in the mortgage, uh, in the mortgage backed securities because they never really stopped that one or slowed that down. But we'll be watching and, and especially in the uh, monetary velocity. That's also going to tell us if we've entered that hyperinflationary phase, because also think about this. We've been taught that there are no choices, that the only choice is stocks or bonds or, you know, uh, fiat money products. So if people get scared of the dollar collapse and right now the dollar with the inversion of the three month to the 10 year and the fact that the Fed funds rate is Pretty, I mean, it's almost exactly the same as the 10-year bond, which means at the moment, cash is king. I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow. We're just in a really, I, I know it seems like it's schizophrenic, but that's because the markets are schizophrenic. And the question is, will this new quantitative easing that they're going to do be like pushing on a string? In China... They've released a lot more debt into the system, but it hasn't been stimulative. So it's like pushing on a string. That's why I can't tell you definitively one way or the other. Of what phase we're actually in. Well, I know we're in the end phase, but, but and, and my bet is that they're going to run these money presses full force and take the markets a lot higher and allow all of these unicorns to come, or most of them to come to market at severely nosebleed levels, you know, getting that first day pop like we talked about when I did a piece on that, and I'm gonna do a follow-up piece on it because the flood's begun anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I've got some great stuff to, sh to show you um, what I talked about in the first video. That's why it's kind of hard because I don't know if they're gonna be able to pull it off. Markets are a lot higher than they were so on December 24th, right? It's that V-shaped recovery because, because the Fed turned around and said, you know, we're going to stop the runoff of the balance sheet and there are not going to be any more interest rate hikes. And in fact, eh, we could do QE again and we could lower interest rates again. They're out of ammunition. That's why we're at the end. So to answer this person's question, really, oh, are you, kind of do you think that, we, so what it, for, what, first of all, what's a melt up phase? Well, that simply would quick. be, okay, simply quick. That would be when you would see a rapid rocket of the markets 
and it's more panicked than anything else because they're trying to flee the collapse of the dollar. Okay. Okay. So we're not currently, are we currently in that phase or not? No, we could be at the very beginning because what, and what's going to really tell us that e either that or we're closer to the end than anybody realizes. Okay. The melt up phase would be the very last thing before complete collapse. And right? then that would be the meltdown phase is the collapse part. Correct. Collapse part. Okay. And ain't nobody getting out of that one alive. So it's like the peak of the bull market is the melt up, so to speak, on a right. chart, right? And the meltdown is right after. Right. And you know what I should do if, uh, Megan, if you, if you um, write this down, you know, because I mean, I've shown it on a few different charts, like in Cyprus and in Argentina and Venezuela. And um, if you guys, it, let us know if you think it would be helpful for me to do a piece just on the markets and that melt up and that meltdown phase I can where tell I can you, show you. There's going to be enough people that are going to say yes to that. All right. Then, then I'll put that on my agenda and I'll, you know, and I'll, I'll make that happen. And because I know this is really challenging, I'll make that happen. We'll, okay. we'll do one on that. All right, so James R. asks, if the banks are able to control the supply of gold through releasing any, any quantity back into the market, why is gold a good long-term investment if its price is limited by central banks? That's a fabulous question. And the reason is because even though it has been managed or manipulated since we were on the gold standard and started to shift, at the end of the day, it is inflation that supports their plans. And when the inflation no longer works, when we go into this hyperinflation, they have to reset the entire system and gold, physical monetary gold is the tool that they use to reset the system. Well, and I think, I think if you simply just take out the word investment and replace it with insurance, Good point. You, you're, you answered the question, right? Yes. Yeah. In a short way, it's why is gold a good long-term insurance yeah, if its I, price is limited by central banks? Right. Right. And, and we also have to keep in mind, see, we think that central banks are perpetual, but the experiment that we're living in now is the first time historically when they have been perpetual because typically before this, governments knew that they were going to destroy the currency because that's the tendency. And that's where we are right now, is the currency is about to be destroyed. And that's why central banks are so scared because the question is whether or not they're gonna be able to stay in power after this implosion. Well, they'll figure out a way. <laughs> well, they're working on it. Yeah. They're trying to engineer a soft landing. The question is, will they be able to pull it off? And chances are, no. All right, another price question. So Paul S. asks, when I think of deflation, I relate it to lower prices. Correct. Hence, gold and silver would decrease in price during times of deflation. I'm pausing well, for effect. Okay. Do you want to answer anything right there? Well, historically, that's actually not accurate. That's why I wanted to pause. Right. So, um, and if you make a note on that, I know I have the graph, uh, the graphs that show that. So you have to remind me. Graph on price, price um, is uh, deflating, but gold, to gold not. Well, what happens to gold during inflation and deflation? Both. I know I have uh, material on that. And then that. what do you want to do? Put it in a link to the... Yeah. Okay. To the blog piece? Right. Okay. So from what I gather from information you've presented, this does not seem to be true. Correct. Can you tell me if this is the case and also explain why the price of gold would rise? Well, there are a couple things in there. So no, and you'll see it through actual periods of deflation. Because what is deflating or what wants to deflate are the older overvalued fiat markets. That's what's really deflating and what they're, and there's only way to fight that and that's with inflation. So um, it's not, it's not the gold and the silver. I'll put those graphs up because gold and silver are real money. It's the fiat that's deflating. It's those overvalued products that are deflating. The gold and silver is designed 
and function because of the demand. And that's the other piece that people never really think too much about. And you know it's something I talk about all the time because for some weird reason, nobody else does. Mm -hmm. But there's total global demand across every area of the economy. So there's really no big reason for prices to deflate because demand, while that is going to vary, so you're going to have prices shift because of the demand and the supply, at the end of the day, there's a finite amount of gold and silver. And it has properties that nothing else has. So there's always demand, and that's why it doesn't lose its value. That's another reason why it doesn't lose its value. Right, over the long term. But essentially, I mean, we can talk about like 2008 when we saw uh, gold actually went down. Spot and gold it, went right, down. Right, spot gold went down. And, uh, you know, and, and there was a lot of talk about that being because the liquidity was drying up. People needed liquidity, so they were selling off the phys their, their paper and physical metal in order to get access to... Uh, cash to be able to cover the losses on the markets. Okay, right? let me interject something there. Mm -hmm. They were selling off the paper, but not the physical because demand was so strong in the physical that you couldn't get, like you couldn't get things like bullion and junk silver. Yeah, and definitely the collectible got tight coins. for sure. Exactly. So it wasn't that there was a flood of selling of the physical. Mm -hmm. There was a flood of selling of the paper. Which drove the prices down. Temporarily. Yeah, correct. But the then collectible right after that, gold they took off. Right. But mm -hmm. the collectible gold made its all time high during this same period. So yep. there's an unlimited amount of digital gold, but there's a finite amount of physical. Which is also why you want it and also why they use it to reset the currencies against. It's not an accident. Yeah. And I wouldn't say all time high, I would say that trend high. C correct. Thank you. Yeah. You're correct. Yeah, it's not. No, that was in 89 was right. the all-time high. I meant that trend high. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I like that. I like that name. Rockapoco. Uh, should I contribute money to my 401k? I would if they're going to match it. If uh, they're going to match, wouldn't you? Uh, if, if they're going to... Up to the it, point uh, that they would match? Uh, it's free money. If you... Well, it... Here's the problem. It depends on where we are in the trend cycle. Yep. Because at this juncture, where we are, if you put it in the 401k, it's going into some product. Mm -hmm. So it's going to go away. So under normal circumstances, I would agree with you 100%. But these are not normal circumstances, hence going back to the very first question. Okay? We are between a rock and a hard place. I and agree. we know where that's going to end up. And it's going to end up crushed. I would say it now, depends on how much if, how much matching you get, right? Because you can all you didn't, if you have money in there. But it depends on if you have access to it. Yes, if you can that's do, what I was going to say. If you can, exactly, because it, it. it depends. If you can do an in-service withdrawal, roll over election, then they typically will allow you to roll over up to 50%. And the rules may have changed. I haven't looked at them in a while. But the last time I did... It was up to 50% and or $50,000, whichever was lower. Then you could roll that into an IRA, and then, frankly, you could take distribution and pay your taxes and penalties or whatever. You have better access to it. Or there are some 401ks that are structured in a way, if you've met certain age and time requirements, that you can take some distributions. So it kind of it depends on your personal circumstance um, and whether or not you actually have access to it. If you don't have any access to it after that, I mean, if you do, you need to protect it with gold outside. And that's part of the strategy too, because there are some, th some things that you have like a 403B, you're not going to be able to touch it, period, but you're going to have to contribute no matter what. So, okay, fine, do that. Because that's how it's set up. Just make sure you have it balanced, properly diversified over here mm -hmm. to recoup right. when you can't have, have access have to it. Have your insurance policy in place. Exactly. Exactly. Anonymous, I like I liked this question because uh, I do, Anonymous says, I only hold about 30 ounces of silver, but around 21 ounces of it is junk silver. Should I sell off the junk silver and use the money to buy 0.999? No. Mm-hmm. 
You know, um, I own a lot of junk silver. It's perfect for barterable and uh, it gives you those different sizes to work with. So no, you already paid your fees on them. You already paid your shipping on them. I own it. They're still silver. They're uh, more I would argue that having too. junk silver as your very first line of defense is the best way to go. The very first one? Right. Before like if you, cash? No, no, no. I mean like uh, as cash. far as silver is concerned. Correct. Or in your, Correct. In your, just in your, your regular portfolio, if you're just, just starting out and you have a little bit, go junk silver first because it gives you the barter ability, the best barter ability, and it's still recognized. Silver. Right. And it's recognized. Right. Right? I mean, they may only think it's a dime where it's, you know, not really a, a tenth of an ounce of silver. It's more like three quarters of an ounce of silver. But we take all that into consideration when we're doing our calculations. So, yeah, yeah I think no, it's like 14 dimes to 14 dimes, I think. 14 dimes to an ounce? Yeah, something like that. Uh, let's see. So, yes, keep your junk. And and I know a lot of people will comment because I'll say roughly a tenth of an ounce. It's only because it's easier. It's an easier way to think about it. Right. Than going yeah, but it's super like 14. Fractional. Right. But we um, do calculate that out. So. When do you... Uh, Jeju... JJ Hinduja. Hinduja. When do you think a big bank or financial institution will collapse like Lehman Brothers in 2008? Who knows? That's a tough I one. I mean, honestly, they're pretty much insolvent, so I think what will... You do have a crystal ball back there. Maybe we should, maybe we should consult. Cons we could. We could. That's hard to say because, really, we know that the banks are um, primarily insolvent because of all the leverages and the derivatives, but we also know that they're all interconnected. And that's why we still have Deutsche Bank and Commerce Bank and, you know, many of the other ones, Morgan Stanley, and which is the most dangerous bank here. So in June, we'll be looking at, well, they're changing the stress test, so, but we'll look at them anyway and we'll see what that looks like. But that's not until June. So uh, I, it, I don't know. I don't know. When they're ready for it to collapse, then it'll collapse. I like to ask you those sometimes because you... This is impossible to answer. <laughs> it is. I, so if I were queen, we did that one one time. Will you put up the any reminders that we have? She but knows yeah. Oh, you I'm, already know. Right. Boom. Because it's just tomorrow. Tomorrow, I really this is a critical, and I I almost interrupted, but now it's gotten a lot more meat to it. But the three month and the ten year yield has inverted, and actually the Fed funds rate is pretty much where the ten year yield is. This is not good. This is an expansion. The three month, the six month, and the one year bonds are paying more than the 10 year bond. That's not good. So we are gonna talk a lot more about that tomorrow. And we also have to talk about Brexit this week because this is something that's coming up pretty shortly. And when you're asking, when can a big bank collapse? Mm, let me dig into the Brexit. We'll, we'll talk more about that because I think it's going to be a derivative implosion that cannot be covered up that will make the next big bank failure obvious. And, you know, I mean, they'll postpone it and maybe they won't even actually ultimately do the Brexit. We'll see. We'll talk more about that this week as well. Cool. Anything so, else? I think, um, I think that's it for, for the moment until right. tomorrow. So just keep in mind that shields are made of metal, not paper or promises. And until then, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.